You know, one of the goals here is obviously like Michael, he's he just lecture. He, he knows this really well. Dee's has studied, you know, similar things, but also, you know, it comes from more of a pastoral side for, you know, how some of the things, these things could be applied to our church. So thanks for both of y'all, uh, both, you know, being involved in this. Okay, so first question. Uh, how did some apocryphal books come to be accepted by the Roman Catholic Church? Ah, uh, yes. I knew this question. You would mentioned probably come the Apocrypha, yeah. and then you were yeah. like, no, I don't want to talk about this. I'm yes. talking about this. And then somebody was like, no, talk about that. <laughs> so, yeah. I sorry. threw a little seed out there, and someone went for it. Yeah. Um, so, if you remember, the term the Apocrypha is usually referring to a collection of technically Old Testament books, although they're really intertestamental books, adopted by the Roman Catholic Church and not by Protestants. Um, this was part of the conflict at the Protestant Reformation. So if you know a Roman Catholic, they're going to have books in their Old Testament that are different than your Old Testament. Those books are books like 1st, 2nd Maccabees, Judith and Tobit, etc. Um, why did Roman Catholics have those and not? Well, it was adopted formally what's called the Council of Trent in the 16th century as sort of a counter-Reformation move. Um, that's the first time the church officially received those books. That is the Roman Catholic Church. The real question you probably want to know the answer to is, why don't we have it in our Bibles? Here's the reason. Our New Testament authors, Paul, Peter, John, the gospel authors, including Jesus within those, cite the Old Testament hundreds and hundreds of times. Not a single time ever do they cite a book from the Apocrypha as Scripture. Not even once. And so the Protestants basically have the same Old Testament, we argue, that Jesus and the apostles had in their day. Um, so that's why we have a different Old Testament canon. We're going to argue there's the one that was originally there for Israel, but that was added later by uh, Roman Catholics at, in, at the Council of Trent. Did you, did you talk about the Council of Jamnia? I know it was late to your... I did not talk about that. But no apocryphal books recognized in that. No. And then the other one that I've thought is interesting is Jerome himself, when translating the apocryphal books, basically has this note, these are not part of the Bible. Yeah, so there was a big fight between <laughs> Jerome and Augustine over this. Um, so when we say they were not formally received by the church until Trent, that's not to say they weren't ever used or debated. And they, the debate goes all the way back to Augustine and Jerome. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, sort of the same subject area. Are, are there any apocryphal books that would still be helpful to read or study? Obviously not scripture, but for any educational purposes... Yes, so um, it depends how we define apocryphal, but I'll tell you a little interesting story here about the way the early church used apocryphal writings. A number of Orthodox church fathers would sometimes quote and use apocryphal gospels. It's pretty rare, but did it from time to time. Um, they wouldn't use them as scripture, but they would use them as helpful. So what you have to realize about writings outside the New Testament is that they may contain true things, even if they don't contain scriptural things. So remember, something can be true without being scriptural. Encyclopedias can be true, but that doesn't mean they're scripture. So all scripture is true, but not all true things are scripture. Um, and so, you know, you can use true things outside the canon for purposes other than you would use a scriptural book for, and we have church fathers that do that from time to time. Um, you have to be very cautious with that. Hmm. There's other non-canonical writings which the term apocryphal doesn't quite apply to that are orthodox that are edifying for the early church. Books like First Clement, the Didache, Shepherd of Hermas. These aren't technically apocryphal works, but they're non-canonical works that can be beneficial. Totally agree. I mean, yeah, I mean, is Canon Revisited helpful? Like, you know, I mean, there's other writings that are not scripture, but are helpful writings. Yeah, yeah I mean, the analogy I always give people is that, you know, if you give a message or a Bible study or a sermon, would you ever quote C.S. Lewis as a helpful guide to what you're doing? Yeah, you quote people all the time. Well, he's not in the Bible, right? But yet, he's an extra canonical work you find helpful. Well, that can yeah. be true of other works out there. We just have to make sure we're careful which ones we use and that they're yeah. orthodox. One thought on uh, the Old Testament. So, I know you're a New Testament scholar, and uh, I actually remember hearing Bruce Ware say at one point, it, you know, speaking of canonization, he kind of like skipped over the, the Old Testament pretty quickly because he was like, well, Jesus was using it, you know, it was like, this was, it was you know, it, it was accepted. But do you have any thoughts on the canonization of the Old Testament books? 
Well, one thing, I, it's a big subject, as you might imagine. Yeah. Um, one Just thing briefly. that I think is worth noting is it seems to be well established and agreed upon in Jesus' own day. If you think about it, um, the, the, the Jesus and the Pharisees and Jesus and the Jewish leaders disagreed about virtually everything. Uh, every theological thing you could come up with, they were on different sides of it, always arguing and debating. But you never hear one time in the debate, Jesus quote from a scriptural book and a Pharisee say, well, that's not in our Bible. Mm. Or, well, that's in your Bible, not in our Bible. What you realize is that, that Israel, as God's people, had rallied around and had received and recognized these books for quite a while before Jesus showed up on the scene. So it was an established core thing that uh, seemed to be well in place by Jesus' day. And here's the thing I want you to realize. It was in place in Jesus' day without a vote, without a church council, and without some sort of uh, uh, decision-making body. The Council of Jamnia that was mentioned a moment ago used to be thought of as a thing that, that did some of that in the first century AD, but it's been shown now that it really doesn't play that role, um, and scholars have changed their direction on that. And even if you think about Dead Sea Scrolls, I mean, here you have a document that, or documents that we know were lost for 2,000 years uh, showing up in the 40s that contain all of the Old Testament books, except for uh, Esther. But all of the Old Testament books, except for Esther, are found you know, here you know, almost 2,000 years after the fact. So to Mike's point, I mean, this is an agreed upon canon of books um, by these people that their whole life was given to scribing out the Old Testament books. I mean, that's pretty compelling evidence. Yeah. You, you may not realize how many of our major archaeological finds are so recent, but you would, you would have wanted to live in either Egypt or Israel in the 1940s because those are two big finds, right? Muhammad Ali in Egypt found the Nag Hammadi text, and then 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Um, by, the, by the way, did you know that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found by a shepherd looking for lost sheep? That's true. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> he, he was looking for lost sheep on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea and was throwing rocks into the caves to try to, the sheep go in there to cool off from the heat. He was hoping that he would scare the sheep out and he threw in there and heard pottery breaking. Um, and then he went in and found the first of the stone or the masonry jars. Okay, next question. It's really getting to how important is authorship as it pertains to canonization considering the author of Hebrews is unknown. And then the person asking the question kind of wants you to speak on behalf of Martin Luther. I don't know how comfortable you feel doing that, but they said, why, why did Martin Luther consider it a disputed book? So if you want to, you know, approach that how you will. The book of Hebrews? In Sorry, particular? the book of Hebrews. Oh, I'm surprised I didn't mention James. Or Revelation. Yeah. Maybe. Well, you know. So... <laughs> I, I, <laughs> We're just adding to your question here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it would be helpful to them. Yeah. yeah so James. one of the things I argue in Canon Revisited is that one of the core indicators of canonicity is written by an author that can speak for Jesus, right? And those were the apostles. Um, now, of course, we have books of the New Testament that weren't directly written by apostles, Mark, Luke, etc., that were written by companions of apostles. So the, the way that's understood is, is that what you want to do when you read the New Testament is know that you have apostolic content there which can come either from, directly from an apostle, or from someone who got it directly from an apostle. So the question is, do we have any reason to think that our books in our New Testament are filled with apostolic content? The answer is a hearty yes, and we can't go through all 27, but the question mentioned Hebrews, because it's anonymous. What about that book? Well, we don't know the exact author, but we do know that the author positions himself as having received his material from the apostles. He does this in Hebrews chapter two, if you look at it. This is actually one of the reasons why most people don't think that Paul wrote Hebrews. Because the author positions himself as someone who got the information directly from the apostles, which is why some people think the author of Hebrews is Luke, interestingly, because the, the author of Hebrews positions himself in a similar way that Luke does in, in Luke's prologue. So you don't have to actually know the name of the author in order to know that they're positioned in a way to speak for God. This is true in the Old Testament, true. There's a lot of books in the Old Testament we don't know the exact author. Um, and so it's a similar principle there. If we were to find, yeah, okay, I thought this was an interesting question. Like, let, let's say that somebody finds a legitimate letter from Paul, the Apostle Paul, and let's just say they where's mail my, it. Did somebody ask you that during you, the... No, where's my, uh, where's my little, the, the group I had dinner with? Oh, the apprentices. Uh, yes, in oh, the yeah. back. Didn't I tell you this would happen? 
Yes. Oh. Is that the group I told this to? Yes. So they were asking me at dinner. So when you get questions in Q&A time, when you speak on Canada, do you mostly know what people are going to ask? And I was like, pretty much. And I said, tonight, I bet you someone's going to ask this question. So here it is, number four. Um, <laughs> so it's one of the most common questions I get. So. Oh, interesting. Well, yeah. I mean... I'm not going to answer I, it, but I just wanted to say okay, that. Okay. Have you had time to think <laughs> about an answer? I mean, I yeah. just... Uh, you know, if we found a letter of no, Paul's today, would we accept here, it? Here's what's curious about this. When Paul wrote his letters, he tells us about other letters he wrote that we don't have. Um, he does this in Corinthians. He does this in Colossians. And so we know this. He know, we know that Paul wrote more than 13 letters. It just statistically, it's likely he would have anyway. So what do we do with these? What, what happened to these other letters? We don't know. Um, I have my own academic theories on this, which I don't think we want to get into tonight. But the point is, we, they, they're lost. What if we found one, is the question. What do we do yeah. with it? And this is one of those questions I go back and forth on. In my book, Canon Revisited, I said, no, it doesn't get added because the canon, by definition, is a foundational uh, collection, and, it, and those books were not foundational because they were lost. But on the flip side, if it's an authentic letter of Paul and we can somehow verify it, then it would be. So I, I tell you, I, I, I go back and forth um, on what we would do with it. Um, but you know, I think statistically pretty unlikely that's ever going to happen. But, but if it did happen, I mean, I, I, no, 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 but I, I mean, I think I would come down pretty hard on, in a position here. Like, I think if we found, you know, the angry letter to the Corinthians or whatever, <laughs> the other letter. We uh, want to keep that one under wraps. Maybe we yeah, wouldn't want yeah, that Yeah, yeah, yeah. We may want to be like, oh, Paul, calm down, bro. But like, uh, um, but I mean, I think we would recognize, we would trust our br- brothers and sisters. It, it wasn't being copied like his other letters. It wasn't being cited. Commentaries weren't being written about it, as we see with all these other New Testament books throughout you know, the second, third, fourth century. Mm-hmm. And so we'd say, well, this is a really interesting find, but it probably wasn't inspired. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's where I would, I mean, is that not? Well, maybe you're raising Not questions. everything Paul wrote was inspired. I mean, in that. Well, y- y- yeah, so no, not everything he wrote is inspired, but everything he wrote in his apostolic office would be inspired. So I tell my students all the time, I was like, we're not suggesting that when Paul made his grocery list that it was inspired grocery list or something like this. So not everything he would write would be inspired. But if he wrote a letter in his office as an apostle, which we would have every reason to think the other Corinthian letter would have been, because actually in the first Corinthians letter he mentions his prior letter, um, then we would think it would have the same, the same weight, which is why I always go back and forth. Yeah, it's a tough one. Now I'm kind of, I'm like trying to look for a question you may never have heard before. Yeah, so let's I'm go like, down the list. You've challenged me a little <laughs> bit. Um, but anyway, so uh, was there a time in uh, the early church when the only form, or, okay, it's, it's mentioning with the church, but let's just say, is, was there a time in, um, uh, in what we know now as Christianity, but early, um, even in the Old Testament, where the, the only transmission of this information was oral. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have a number of, of reasons to think that in the early stages of the faith that the transmission of the text was largely, and even maybe at some phases, exclusively oral. Um, oral teaching, proclamation, preaching and teaching. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we have reasons to think that that would have been there as a phase, but it wouldn't have been exclusive to things being written down. Usually they would, they would go side by side, mm-hmm. and then eventually as the apostles died away, all you're left with is their writings. Um, but there would have been a, quite a bit of oral transmission in the early church. Part of the debate, of course, around that is how reliable was it? Mm. Um, and I think we have good reasons and it could have been very reliable given that we have tradence, if you will, protecting the tradition and delivering the tradition in a way that's, that's consistent and authoritative. Um, but yeah, I think that phase definitely would have been there. Yeah. You agree. Okay. Um, anything wrong with the book of Enoch? Well, it depends what you mean by wrong. Um, so some of you may have heard of what's called the book of Enoch, also known as first Enoch. Mm-hmm. Um, it's what we call an intertestamental book. There's a, so if you look at first century Judaism in the, in, 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 in the scene where Jesus lived and the apostles lived, First century Jews had the Old Testament, right, which they regarded as scripture, but they had a lot of other books they read that they found useful and valuable, and those were also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls collection. So Dead Sea Scrolls collection had our Old Testament books and a bunch of intertestamental writings, one of which is a book called First Enoch, which is purportedly referring to prophecies that go all the way back to the Enoch in the book of Genesis. Now, 
its historical value is mixed. There may be some things in there that, that are old, there's probably some things in there that aren't, and the value of it is, is probably hit and miss. Um, and so certainly it wouldn't be scriptural, and certainly it wouldn't be uh, something we would think is biblical, but it would be probably useful at some points, but at other points not so much, and we have to be very wise about which parts we used or not used. And a lot of the intertestamental, book, intertestamental books are like that. I mean, again, to those kind of books, I mean, like the writings of Josephus, for example, is another kind of book. I mean, different than, than Enoch, but like it, it's another kind of of the period book that gives us information that is helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Jude quotes it, interestingly, which I thought the, the person was going to ask that, but I don't know if they did. So you may know when you read the book of Jude, actually Jude refers to mm-hmm. first Enoch um, and uses it. He doesn't quote it as scripture, but he does re- refer to it as useful and valuable. Right. Um, and so that's another example of how outside books can still be utilized as, as, as helpful, but not, not as scriptural. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have a, a two-part question. I'm going to adapt this question a little bit to apply to both of you in different ways, but it's... Let's just focus. It's mentioning a few different or two different places, but let's just focus at the uh, at the end of Mark. So, mm. some uh, most of a lot of us use ESV. There's a little uh, little section that says, you know, the rest of this, you know, is we don't have consistent records of it, and et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, here's my two parter. I'm curious, you know, what is your take on? Uh, the validity of it belonging maybe in the scripture, in our copies of God's word, uh, D, is my, my question to you would be how do you approach that in preaching and in ministry and how do you think we should read those passages? It's, you know, there's overlap within the yeah. question, but... I'd love to hear your take on that. Why don't you well, jump in first? I, 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 I've never preached the end of Mark because A, it's kind of just weird, you know, <laughs> uh, but I... You know, I mean, if you remember, I preached the beginning of John 8, you know, not long ago. John was the other one mentioned, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so, um, but I said, I, I preach this as something that is in our Bibles that, you know, but I, I said I, I can't preach this with the same kind of authority as I would like an inspired text. And so, I mean, obviously, it is a disputed text, and um, and so... I don't think that we treat it in the same way as we do the rest of the Gospel of John. Or really, I mean, those are the only two large sections of the New Testament that, you know, are disputed in that kind of way. Um, And so, yeah, so it actually gave me, if you remember the sermon, it kind of gave me uh, an opportunity in a kind of Sunday morning sermon moment to have a discussion kind of like what we're having tonight. What is canon? What is inspiration? What does this mean? And so I spent the first 10 minutes of the sermon, 12, maybe 15, kind of talking about canon inspiration, those things. And then, of course, I said, I, and, and the way I said it is, I think that these things happen. You know, some people think Luke wrote that section in John there. Um, I think this happened, um, but I just don't think that we treat it with the same kind of, right. you know, veracity that we would uh, a text that we know is inspired scripture. So, be curious here. Yeah, I mean, everybody reading a modern English text, we'll notice when you get the, what's called the long ending of Mark after verse eight, there's a little bracket there that says the earliest manuscripts do not have this section and regularly have people with a panic look come to me and say, what now, you know, can I trust yeah. my Bible? But remember, when we say we believe in an inerrant Bible, almost every orthodox confessional statement about inerrancy says, we believe the Bible is inerrant in the original autographs, meaning the original manuscripts. Why do we say that? because we know that not every copy that will ever be made on planet Earth by every scribe is always gonna be a good one. We have scribes that have made lousy copies of parts of our New Testament. The vast majority of scribes and the overall scribal tradition is very faithful and very steady, but we do have scribes that have variants from time to time. So we have to work our way back to the original. And in those cases, John 8 and Mark 16, um, I think the evidence is those texts were not originally in Mark and John, so yeah, I would not, I would certainly not preach them if I didn't think they were inspired. That's good. Okay, yes or no question, true oh, or false? Oh, this is easy, right? Yes or no? I know, hey, you know, Got a 50 50 shot true at or this. False. I mean, it's not a two-parter, I mean, it's just a true or false. Uh, do we have any original manuscripts of any of the New Testament books? Nope. 
D's. Do you have any? No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I just I feel like you it's have, okay. I'd like to know about that. I was going to say no, but I was like, maybe Mike knows about something that I don't. <laughs> oh, if I had one of those, I would. Yeah, you yeah, wouldn't be would, here. Yeah, yeah, wouldn't yeah, yeah. be here. Yeah, so, right, right. Be in my mansion somewhere. And... <laughs> um, okay, another question. Um, why are there no female authors of the New Testament writings? Uh, yeah, um, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think I've gotten that question. Wait, did we? Yeah, oh, okay. you did it. Yeah, right, someone, cool. someone should get a little gold star. I've heard that question gold in a while. Star, we yes. got a round of applause. Gold star. Uh, yeah, well, uh, the first thing I'd want to say to that question is, um, and, and this is something that I've continued to be amazed by as I've done my own study of the New Testament, is the really impressive role that women played in the ministry of Jesus and in the ministry of Paul. If you doubt this, you need to go read Romans 16 again, where Paul gives all his greetings at the end of the letter, which we always skip over, don't we? Um, and where he thanks everybody. And nearly half of an incredibly long list are women that he calls co-workers, co-heirs, she hosted a church in her house, this, that, and the other, thanking them, so-and-so was a mother to me, and Jesus does the same thing. We see this in Luke 8 with women, part of his entourage. So first thing I recognize is, is that question is a good question, but don't think the answer means that women don't have a valuable place within the early church, which they did, and still, of course, today in the church. Why, why would they not have women authors? Well, first of all, most of the authors were apostles. Okay, and so Jesus chose 12 apostles. He chose all men apostles. I think that probably does speak to the way he wants uh, leadership in the church, which is a question for another day. But he chose 12 male apostles, and if most of the authors in the New Testament are apostles, well, then, then you're gonna have lots of male authors. As far as the authors that were not apostles, Luke, Mark, and the mysterious author of Hebrews, um, these were companions of the apostles, and we don't know why it had to be a guy. I don't, I don't think it had to be, but that's just the way it fell out. But I think I would certainly want to reassure, reassure whoever asked the question that I think that doesn't bear on right. the fact that women still played a very key and important role in the early Christian church. I've actually written about this in my book, Christianity at the Crossroads, if anyone wants to read more about women's activity in the early Christian ministries. I was going to say, interestingly, Second John is written to a woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Fact. Assuming it's not symbolic of the church, which is debated. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, well, maybe it's not. But yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I'd go either way on that, too, so. <laughs> this, uh, someone in here is hoping you'll speak to the motivations of the writer of the Gospel of Thomas, for example, oh, or yeah. any of the apocryphal, you know, writings. I mean, you know. You know, when we hear that, you know, they're, they're trying to get a hearing, you know, to me, it sounds kind of like, I mean, I, I don't know what the motive is. It doesn't sound great. I mean, could there <laughs> have been good motive? I mean, I don't know. Like, what, what, is there any academic thought on the motive of an apocryphal writer? All right, so this is a fascinating area of study and one that happens to be what I did my, doc, my doctoral work on. Christians wrote a lot of apocryphal material, and it, it raises a good question of why did they do this? And I think there's multiplicity of answers. Here's a couple examples. Some, some people wrote apocryphal material to push heretical ideas. Um, we know this for a fact. Um, one, Thomas has a strong Gnostic overtones. Gospel of Peter is Docetic. So if you're a heretic and you want to get a hearing, you, you wrap your new book, your gospel with the apostolic name and send it out. That happened. Believe it or not, though, some wrote apocryphal works for orthodox purposes, to, to protect orthodox teaching. The person who wrote the Acts of Paul, technically the Acts of Paul and Thecla, was, that's, a, that's a fabricated story, didn't actually happen. The person was caught, and Tertullian says he was kicked out of the church for doing it. Mm. And when asked why he did it, he was like, well, I just wanted to, you know, help Paul along here, basically. <laughs> and if you read the Acts of Paul, aside from sort of a, like a, sort of a little bit of an ascetic kind of thing, it's pretty orthodox. Um, so some people wrote for orthodox purposes. I know that's weird in our head. I can't explain that. I'm not defending that, but they did. Here's another thing that's interesting about apocryphal works. Some wrote for entertainment. We do know that a number of apocryphal stories seem to be just for fun. Um, a good example of this are some of the apocryphal acts if you've read the Apocryphal Acts, in the Acts of John, they baptize a lion, which is crazy. Um, and I think it's in the Acts of Paul, uh, Simon Magus flies over the city of Jerusalem. And Peter 
curses him, and then he crashes. Um, also in the Acts of John, there's a prayer. John's sleeping at night in a hut, and he's getting bitten by bedbugs, and so he prays the bedbugs will stop biting, and they miraculously all leave the room. And then when so- someone shows up the next morning to find John, all the bedbugs are waiting outside the door, you know, wanting to get back in. I mean, this is the apocryphal Acts, um, and they're weird stuff, but I think largely written for, for entertainment. So I think there's a whole slew of potential purposes. The, the five books that you mentioned in the New Testament canon that uh, it seemed as if there was, uh, uh, people were unsure of their validity. You know, there were, there were certain ones I was like, yep, good to go. Yep. Uh, you know, I came from my mom and dad. I've always known them. And then there was other ones that was like, kind of maybe an uncle. I don't know. I mean, like, you know, the, the question is related to like, how confident can this person be in those five in relation to the other ones? Yeah, so, so I know people get hung up on these de- debated books. So, and they say, well, if they were disputed, m- maybe I can't have right. confidence in them. Here's an interesting question for you. How, how, how much dispute would be too much and how, how much would you expect there to be if God gave his books in normal historical channels? In other words, no one ever stops and asks, well, what did I expect to happen? Most people, if they think about it, do I really expect that by the year 80, 70, there's absolute, immediate, non-unanimity in all 27 books, not a nary concern anywhere, everyone's immediately, yes, all the, that's just not realistic. So is it one year that's too many, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? In other words, what people don't realize is that no one expects a pristine, perfect rollout, if you wanna say it that way. Everyone knows that when you deliver books this way, it's gonna take time. So I wanna suggest to you that what you should be amazed by is not that there was a few disputes about the smaller books. What you should really be amazed by is how much unanimity there was around the core so early. That's just unbelievably uh, impressive. Um, so what's, uh, the other thing I would say about this is that the church did finally settle on these five. Sure. And I don't, I don't think that should be missed. They, they did the homework, they looked into it. They, there was a lot of heretical stuff floating around. They, they decided these were not some of those. And so I think you can actually even have more assurance yeah. that the church actually went the extra mile to uh, make sure these books were authentic. And it's not like any of these came in like really late. They were always right. on like at least yep. a spurious list, yep. um, you know, all the way through. It's not like in the third century, all of a sudden, like James shows up. Yeah. They were, they were always there. Yeah. yeah that's good. Uh, a note about translations. Um, are we are we losing any authority with an English versus you know Greek New Testament? It's an interesting way to put the question. Are we losing any authority? Um, so, a couple things to note there. First, you know, there's a reason why seminary students study the original languages, Greek and Hebrew, because obviously God inspired the Bible in Greek and Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic uh, in the Old Testament. He didn't inspire it in English. He didn't inspire it in other languages. Now, that having been said, that doesn't mean that you can't trust your English translations. We have really good English translations, and the church has a really long, good history of translating the Bible in different languages. And yes, you can hold your English Bible up and say, this is the word of God with all confidence. That said, though, you need to realize that all translations are interpretation, okay? They are the beginning process of exegesis. Because part of what you do when you translate is you say, how can I take what this text means and put it in a different language? but then you have to know what that text means. And don't, don't think you can just say word for, it doesn't work word for word. Like, well, just take the word, no, there's too many decisions and rewriting. So you have to have a good English translation. Not all are as good as others, but we have many, many good ones. And I'm actually, unlike some that, that tend to think there's only a couple, I actually think we have a lot of good options in the English translation world. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I, I use the ESV, I like it, but I don't think it's the only good option. I think we have a lot of good choices. You have any thoughts? What do you guys use here? Yeah, I mean, we use ESV, but, you know, I think just for this, for this is a new conversation for you, there's kind of two schools of this, for, or there's two kind of sides of translational work, formal equivalency, which is more trying to go for a word for word. The, the kind of rule of thumb is it's better Greek or better Hebrew, but maybe a little choppier English. And then there's dynamic equivalency, which there is more of a translation, it's more of a interpretation, um, but a lot of times those are easy to read, and I'm kind of with Mike, I, I, you know, 
I mean, we preach out of the ESV, but a lot of times we do our in-home Bible studies out of the New Living Translation just because it's easier to read. It's, 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 it's more flowing. And so my thing is any Bible you're reading is better than no Bible. You know, <laughs> yeah, it, it's good. It, it, find, find the Bible that, that you find yourself reading regularly. Um, and, of course, you know, obviously the formal equivalency for deep Bible study is, is best and those are things like the NASB, uh, the CSB, RSV, ESV, King James, New King James. Um, so, Actually, some of you who are older, so I still love the 84 NIV. So, so, well, whoa, all right, right here. I got a shout out for the 84 NIV. How about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know the NIV and Zondervan is now, they don't make it anymore. It's like, it's like a vintage car that they just don't make. You know? it's, like, so, it's, like a, it's like a record yeah, I know. I got to go, yeah. go on the black market to buy, buy it on eBay. for NIV. Yeah. What's up with that? Uh, actually, I like it better than the ESV. Um, I just use ESV because I can't get the 84 NIV anymore. Um, and no one else uses it. Part of, part of it is, part of the, the translation decision is also practical. If every yeah. time you read, it's a different translation than everybody else, it, that's irritating. It becomes a headache. And then, you, well, which translation are you using? So part of it is just, you know, within reason, you just try to fit in with whatever your church is doing. So I think that's legitimate within boundaries. I grew up on the 84 NIV. Yeah, I love so, it. Man. Uh, it's yeah. great. Zondervan, you're, you're are you listening to me? <laughs> you're you on your video. Bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> they're out there. Yeah, I know. They're, they're watching. Trust me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Zondervan yeah. is tuned in yes. to Christ Kevin. It's Friday night event. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that's, that's true. true. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so are there any other historical documents or sources outside of the, uh, the books of the Bible that would echo what we read in the books of the Bible? Does that make sense to ask that well? Yeah, so that's a very broad question. So maybe they're asking, are there other documents besides the Bible that confirm the stories in the Bible? Yeah, that's a, yeah. let's ask oh that gosh. question. Tons. Uh, yeah, and, and depends on what they mean by confirm. So let's imagine, for example, that we have Jesus healing someone at the pool of Bethesda. Okay, so you're like, well, do you have another something outside the Bible telling that story? Well, no, because we have just the four gospels from the first century. So you don't have like 10 other gospels from the first century telling the story of the healing at the pool. But we have lots of documentation that there was a city called Jerusalem that had a pool of Bethesda that it looked like this. That, that people right. went to it to bathe and that Jesus showed up. I mean, sure. everything confirms the story. In fact, I don't know if you've read recently, they're doing more excavations on this pool and they're planning to open it up to the public at some point um, where this healing took place, very famous healing in, in the Gospel of John that, that uh, in all the archaeological evidence fits exactly with what John tells us. So there's total mm-hmm. outside confirmation, but maybe not necessarily in the way this person yeah. um, is wondering. And there's obviously other historical documents and even there's, I mean, so things like Josephus, we already mentioned, but then there's also like, you know, you mentioned the pool, I mean, Pontius Pilate, like there's a, this famous stone at Caesarea Maritana where you see his name. I mean, so the, the, the records of scripture are affirmed over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, even things like the Exodus, which has obviously been disputed by archaeology, archaeologists keep going back and forth on that, but now... So, so for what I've heard recently, they say that, of course, there was an exodus. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, a, it's one of those things that, you know, um, the, the written record is so much better than the archaeological, you know, kind of puzzle piecing uh, that these guys are doing. Uh, so when, if you read somebody that says, oh, the archaeology shows there was no this, there was no that, um, you know, I, I just say just give the archaeology 15 years and they'll probably change their mind because they're just putting together old rocks that they're finding in different places. I mean, we were, we were just overseas. I mean, we were just in Rome and there, there, there's literally a million, there's millions of rocks in boxes that they're trying to figure out where it goes. I mean, and this is Rome. This is actually, this is yeah. more modern. And so the written record is always better than the archaeology and the written record of scripture to what Mike's been saying all night. I mean, there's so many copies. They're just having over and over and over again in so many different places. It is, it is unlike anything else in, in, in ancient writing. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to note that prior generations of scholars, to, to the point that was just made, you just think Pontius Pilate was a made-up figure, that he didn't exist. 
And then not only the, the find on the pillar, the, ep, the, the epigraphic evidence regarding Pontius Pilate, but now since then, tons of other things have emerged about Pontius Pilate. So now people write whole books on Pontius Pilate now, whereas before they didn't even think he existed. So you just realize that you know, the, the, these sorts of sciences yeah. have limitations. And whatever they're telling you at one moment, you just have to realize there's only a certain level of certainty about it. It could change. So You know, one of the things, as you were mentioning, some of the... Uh, stories within the uh, apocryphal writings, you mentioned kind of how weird they are. It's like, you know, it's, Jesus is uh, really tall here, and so it's, <laughs> it's like, it's really weird. But, you know, some people could read our Bible and say, well, you know, this is kind of weird too. So they, I, I think this is where the, the question is coming from. You know, is, is it possible that we would find an apocryphal um, something, with it, something within an apocryphal writing weird where maybe we shouldn't, we're just not used to that part of the weirdness. Yeah, so uh, well, yeah, I, I certainly agree that, when you, that weirdness is a subjective thing, yeah. and that some people read the canonical gospels and say, this is plenty weird enough, thank you very much. <laughs> um, but, but I would say that what, what's different about the weirdness in a lot of our apocryphal gospels is that they clearly are doing things that are filling in the gaps left by the canonical four. Mm. So they show that they're later, they're riffing off the four. I gave you the example of the, 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 the resurrection scene, which you know, you, you, no one's there to see it in ours, and then suddenly you got someone there to see it. Same thing is true also in, in Apocryphal Gospels with Jesus as a child. So I don't know if you were wondering mm. what Jesus was like growing up. Everybody wants to know that. Everyone's curious about that. You know, Jesus ever get in trouble? Did he ever get spanked? How many times did Jesus' brothers and sisters hear the phrase, why can't you be more like your brother Jesus, right, or something like this? <laughs> so what do you know about Jesus' childhood? The Chronicle Gospels give us a grand total of one story, the story in Luke. Jesus is in the temple as, as a boy at 12. Well, guess what the apocryphal Gospels do? They fill in that gap in spades. So we have all of these infancy Gospels. Infancy Gospel of Thomas, different from the Gospel of Thomas, the Proto-Evangelium of James, all this stuff comes out clearly filling in the gap. Yeah. Now, is it possible that we could find an apocryphal gospel that's just weird, but we just did a certain kind of weirdness we, we weren't ready for yet, but is authentic? Well, that's possible, but we'd have to have a reason to think it's authentic, and every apocryphal gospel now is second century or later. If we could find a first century apocryphal gospel that had some real historical credibility, then we could have that conversation. But given what we have now, I would mm -hmm. never pref preference later gospels over earlier ones. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. The, the thing about so, the, I mean, obviously the writings of Paul and then the early gospels, I mean, they're written during the time of eyewitnesses. I mean, people right. are still alive. And so you can't just say, you know, 60 foot tall Jesus with the cross that speaks um, because, I mean, there are people that are there to verify whether or not these things happen that are still alive. And obviously, you know, think of Paul, you know, making an appeal to this, you know, go ask the 500 witnesses that the resurrection actually did happen. Another thing too, to Mike's point, you know, earlier, you know, the, the, the miraculous or weird events that we do have in our Bible are, you know, to some degree verifiable, like the pool of Bethesda is a good point. I mean, just that he was making, I mean, there, there is a pool. It's described in a certain way. People did go there for healing. I mean, there, there, there are events that line up. Yes, it was miraculous. Yes, it was supernatural. Yes, it's not normative or natural. Yeah. And so obviously we recognize the supernatural, you know, that the Bible is describing. But the, the, the verification of it, the, the ability to verify is certainly there in the text. Um, and there even, I would say, by eyewitnesses that were living at the time of these writings. Yeah, that's good. So during your talk, you, were, you said a few times, you know, the church recognized, the church found this... Um, you know, attendee is wondering who is the, the church that you're speaking about. It's not the council. It's um, right. You know. No, great question. So yeah. So my last of my seven objections, or sorry, seven misconceptions that I dealt with is the idea that the church sort of picked the Bible and chose it. And I say no, they recognized it. the The question here is is very is very fair, which is well, what what do you mean by that? Like what what which church did it? And this is, I talk about this in my book, Canon Revisited, how the, the church received the canon by consensus is the language I used. And by consensus, I mean broad geographic swath of the church collectively embraced these books 
um, as recognizing they're from, from God. Um, and that broad consensus has held for the duration of the last 2,000 years. So that's what I mean by the church, and it's this broadness. Now, does that mean there's no pockets with differences? Well, you can find heretical groups in the second century with a different canon. Mm. You can find heretical groups now with a different canon. Right. Um, so, but does that negate the consensus? No, because that's exactly what a consensus is. It's a large, unified uh, group that doesn't mean there's no exception. So that's an important qualification. I make it more length in my book. I didn't make it, obviously, tonight, but I appreciate that question. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the way that I've heard, I think, this kind of, I mean, this is obviously the big kind of Protestant Catholic debate, if you will. Um, and again, I, I mean, I have a lot of respect for the Roman Catholic Church. And, you know, my family, I come from a Roman Catholic, but, but my family was Roman Catholic. I mean, I, I come from that background. But I, the way I've heard it said that I think is very helpful is Catholics believe that the church gave us the Bible. Mm-hmm. Protestants believe that the Bible gave us the church. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, obviously I'm a Protestant. I, I, I think that that is right. And even in modern times, uh, you see that bear out in the history of the church over and over and over again, where churches drift from the authority of the scripture. Mm-hmm. They cease to be the church. Yeah. And that's been happening from the second century. And that's been happening for a long time, you know, the, the churches that hold to the sufficiency, orthodoxy, truthfulness of the scripture continue to exist. <laughs> they continue to be the church. They continue to be spirit filled. They continue to have authority and life and power. And, um, and, you know, may that always be true of Christ's covenant. Amen. Okay, let me throw a few kind of quicker ones. My wife says on the funner side. I don't know if that's Ooh. a word. I, I, got a, I got a couple questions like for Mike, but funner. I want to... Uh, oh, well, I mean, yeah. are they fun? I mean, I think they're kind of fun, but I w- w- we, just give me, give me time for What's two fun questions. What's not fun about apocryphal I'll gospels. give you... I'll budget, ti- <laughs> I'll budget time for one question. Go for it. Well, I, you know, so Mike, you know, I, uh, you know, bully pulpits. This is... Can oh, I totally, wow. can we I are, totally we change? We are shifting. Oof. And uh, that's not fun. So, yes. But go ahead. Well, we're there. Okay, yeah, well, I'd love to say something about that if you yeah, want to bring it up. Yeah, the other, yeah, yeah, go for it. Well, I mean, you just wrote Bully Pulpit. Yes. Um, and uh, I haven't read it yet, but I hear, you know, it's, it's all the talk. Yeah. And so, wow. um, thank you. And I, uh, um, you know, so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that and just, yes. you know, other things you're thinking about, writing. Yes. And I also have another fun question. You know, RTS, we're big RTS fans yes. here. You know, thank you. We're, yeah. we're Southern Seminary guys, yeah. but we're. Yeah. You know, yeah, we respect. We it. love each other, right? You yeah. know, I used to teach at RTS here in Atlanta. I love those guys, Guy Richard. It's a great school. Um, so I'd love to hear kind of what's going on at RTS too. So That's great. bully pulpit RTS. Yeah. So uh, obviously, most of my writings up to this point have been on canon and text. I think everyone knows that. But this last year, I just released a book called Bully Pulpit, and the subtitle is Confronting the Problem of Spiritual Abuse in the Church. And I've done a bunch of podcasts on it. And the very first question I get in most podcasts is you know, this is outside of your normal vein here. What, why are you writing on this topic? Um, and the answer is, um, you know, I'm not just a biblical scholar. I'm also a seminary president. And I think a lot about leadership and what leaders were producing and what leaders were seeing in the church. And the short version is, is I've, I've grown concerned over the last mm-hmm. five years over some patterns. And it's not just the high profile the rise and fall of Mars Hill stuff. I think it's stuff that I've seen even in my own circles and seen around. And I just want to make sure that we're as a church producing gentle shepherds of the flock. Yes, strong in their own godly way for Christ, but bringing that combination of, of gentle strength and play that, that makes sure that, that we're not um, leading our churches in harsh and heavy-handed ways. So that's, a, that's, a, that's on my heart, and that's why I wrote the book, and uh, I hope it's helpful. Yeah, so that's great. Yeah. Um, As far as RTS, doing great. You know, I was telling somebody over dinner that maybe didn't know, we have eight residential campuses now. I know that's nuts. Um, We have three big ones, Jackson, Orlando, Charlotte, sort of two medium ones, one here in Atlanta, one in D.C., and then uh, smaller ones, one in New York. We partner with Tim Keller up there, and then we've got one in Dallas and Houston, so eight now. And the Lord's good to us. We're enrollment's up, and God's blessed us. Yeah, well, I know you're doing amazing work there. Building a great faculty, I mean, the faculty across your whole corpus of campuses is, is impressive. And so, I mean, I would highly recommend RTS to anyone looking for theological education. So, Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. 
There are a lot of questions that came in. I feel like that's a great place to land the plane. Well, look, can we go? Can we? Can I keep going with the fun stuff? I, I got a few more fun ones. Oh, you, do you, I, who has the fun one? You or me? I've got You've a couple got fun more ones. fun ones. Let's do your fun ones. Well, I want to hear about your family, Mike. I mean, oh, we yeah. know about your lovely yeah. wife, Melissa. You've got... Um, hey, one of my fun ones that I got was give us one piece of marriage advice. Okay. Oh, so well, let's, just fun? You know, let's, let's, let's wrap it up. Yeah, we can do that. I thought you were going to ask you like Simpsons this. trivia or something. I don't know. Yeah, we yeah, should have yeah, been doing yeah, this the yeah. whole time, dudes. We just finally got our stride. I don't know if you saw my Babylon B. Some of you may have known I was on the Babylon B last year, two years ago, doing an interview for the Babylon B on stuff like this. Biblical authority, and they said in the middle of my interview with the Babylon Bee, we, we, heard, you, we heard you love the Simpsons. <laughs> and I was like, yeah? They're like, well, we're going to stop our interview, and we're going to do a live trivia question <laughs> right now to test how much you know the Simpsons. So they did. They stopped the interview and recorded this 20-minute quiz, pop quiz, Simpsons pop quiz. And so um, you can watch it. It's online, but uh, I thought do? that's what you were going to do. We won't do that. Uh, we won't do yeah, that. yeah, thanks. Um, I did all right. I don't know if that's good or bad. You know, you can look at that <laughs> yeah, two yeah, different yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. Should be proud of yeah, that. I don't know shame. if I should be proud of that or ashamed. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I'm just so blessed with my family. I, you guys know about my wife, Melissa, who I'm so proud of, works for the Gospel Coalition, just recently promoted to vice president there. I don't know if, 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 if uh, the news has made its way around yet, but uh, just so proud of her. And she's, I think, on her 10th book now. Wow. So I told her that I, this is now a race. I'm going to have to stay slightly, yeah. you know, a little, little good family competition. No, but she is, she's a delight. I, I was apart from raw work. She was in D.C. for a conference, and I, we missed each other at the airport by 20 minutes. Oh. I, was, I was on the way to the airport, and she was leaving the airport, and we were looking for each other on the highway as we passed. So that's the story of our life Man, that's right a now. love story right yeah, there. Yeah, it is. Honey... You know, um, three kids. Uh, my oldest, Emma at Chapel Hill, is a senior. My son, John, doing aerospace engineering at NC State. And then my daughter, Kate, is uh, still at home and at high school. So that's great. Yeah. What chances do the Tar Heels have of making a similar run? Well, they're going to uh, need to make a, a run. A surprising so, Yeah, it'd have to be another surprise. Uh, it was a surprising it? Yeah. run last year. Oh, man. Well, Loved last year. We were talking over How dinner. How good did it feel oh, to oh, beat Coach K? Oh, you would not believe it. Yeah, I mean. Um, I tell people, if you, unless you live on Tobacco Road or gone to school up there, it's just hard to explain the rivalry. But I didn't even care about the national championship last year. Yeah, Once we the won final, the semi, I was like, ah, yeah. that's it. We're done. That's all, that's all <laughs> yeah. we have to do. So I was really pleased. And then I watched the game. We lost. And I was like, okay, it doesn't matter. We beat Duke in the semifinals. So... And then, um, of course, you, you ruined the last day at Cameron Indoor. I mean, the last game at Cameron Indoor. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was, it was just beautiful. That was even more. So Hubert Davis, who's a committed Christian, by the way. I don't know if you know that. Um, he and I were, were in the same year at Chapel Hill. Um, and actually, actually, I think he graduated a year behind me. But um, I didn't know Hubert, but I knew about him. And so he was a player when I was a student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, of course, he always yeah. asked you to come out for the team, I'm sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I told him I'm too busy. But, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, I think they have a, chat, a shot again if they can just figure out what is going on. I, I don't know if anybody knows what's going on, but they need to turn it around, don't they? So Yeah, well. They can't have Auburn win. I mean, what would that be? So I, I don't think it's our year, but we, okay. but maybe. I mean, they're kind of, we lost to Georgia, sadly, but now we've, we're 4-1 in SEC play. So, you know, we'll see. Hey, let's thank Michael Kruger for being here. Thank you. Can you pray for us? Yeah. Deez would pray for uh, us. Let, let me, let, let's stand to pray. I just feel, yeah. just feel like we should. We've been sitting for a little bit. All right. Let's, let's, let's pray together. Father, I am just in awe of even the fact of what we're doing here. Uh, a group of souls communing together to know you, the living God of the entire universe, the eternal, all-wise, all-powerful God. And we can know you, Lord, because you have forfeited your own privacy. <laughs> you've let yourself be known. You've spoken to us. You've revealed yourself to us. And you've done it in this most human of ways, <laughs> through human authors inspired by your Holy Spirit in this most understandable way for us so that our knowledge of you would not just be abstract but would be clear um, and would be very real to us, Lord. 
And so, Father, I pray that we would be a people that treasures this revelation of yourself and that the treasuring of it would mean that we live holy and God-honoring and Christ-filled and gospel-loving lives. So we may this be true of each of us individually for Christ's covenant, for all other churches that are represented here tonight. I think for Mike, for his uh, great defense of just your, the fullness and truthfulness of your word. Yes. I pray that you'd bless his efforts. I pray for the students that he is leading in RTS. I pray for his family, Lord, as he's away from them. Lord, may your hand of protection and blessing be all over them. Yes. And uh, Lord, we come before you tonight with grateful hearts, praying in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here, y'all. Y'all have a great night. <laughs>